Dr. Mark Richardson has extensive experience in risk management and has conducted a variety of high-profile risk assessments in Canada and abroad. In 1995, he authored Health Canada's Assessment of Mercury Exposure and Risks from Dental Amalgam. He's also completed and published the first assessment of risks posed by components and degradation product of composite resin dental materials. He's also contributed to Sweden's review of amalgam. He has lectured on mercury and amalgam risks in Canada, the U.S., Australia, and Europe. He was invited to address the United States House of Representatives Committee on Government Reform and Oversight regarding exposures to and risks from mercury resulting from the use of dental amalgam, and he continues to investigate and publish on this issue. Please welcome to the podium Dr. Richardson. Uh, the title of my talk, I assume you all have your book, and my sincere, again, my sincere apologies for this miscue. Um, the perplexing dilemma of finding the perfect dental material, and by perfect I mean it works marvelously in every situation and presents absolutely no risks. Is there anybody here who thinks such a thing exists? Okay, I don't see any hands, that's good. Are there anybody, is there anybody in the audience with dental amalgam fillings? Dare to raise your hands? My, my wife at the back has raised her hands. Um, the risk assessment I did for Health Canada said for adults, four fillings should not present a significant risk. My wife has four fillings. <laughs> Anybody else? Did I see any other hands? Uh, that's too bad. Um, uh, my apologies. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I have composite resin fillings, 15 of them, or 15 teeth filled with composite resin. I'm assuming there's probably some people with ceramics, with gold, and other materials in the audience. I'm going to talk a bit about some of those materials. Subtitle for my talk really is, risk assessment is never black and white. It is truly always gray, and you have to think about trade-offs, essentially, relative risk, because there isn't ever a risk-free material. Yesterday, I listened to a couple of talks, one on bisphenol A, Boyd Haley's talk, came to the conclusion, I think, that all of my grandchildren are going to be female. And there's probably some women in the audience who think that's a good idea. You may only last a generation, but it will be hassle-free. Um, <laughs> and I am being somewhat cynical. I have done regulatory risk assessment now for 20 or 25 years. I don't believe, at least in the Canadian context, I do not believe that there is a conspiracy to hide fact or anything. I do acknowledge that there are economic social, other political factors that weigh into decisions that are made. But in most cases, I honestly believe that regulators are trying to make the best decisions with limited information to protect the majority or to benefit the majority of the population and recognizing that you can never protect everyone. There are issues of choice that put people at risk. If we wanted to save um, male teenagers or male men aged 16 to 25, we would ban them from driving. That would be the single greatest impact on their life expectancy or their health and safety that we could possibly do, but we won't do that. I listened to somebody yesterday, uh, overheard, my apologies for eavesdropping, whoever was talking will know who they are, um, a person extolling the terrible nature of dental amalgam while puffing on a cigarette. Um, you know, there are voluntary risks that we take all the time. We go for a walk along a busy street. You risk being struck by a car. We make decisions about lifestyle factors, whether we want to smoke or not, whether we're going to eat fatty foods. There are a number of things that we have choices in. Why you're here, and, and listening to this talk is because of those risks we can't control. They are risks and risk assessments that are done on our behalf. And most people are generally comfortable with a lot of that information, but there is normally a minority who are not comfortable with it or dislike it. You are, and I am included in this group, people who don't think dental amalgam is an appropriate material to be used for dental fillings. We are really in the, in the minority. But we're in the minority in part because if you do a survey of the US or Canadian population, probably 75 or 80 percent don't even know there's mercury in the material. And that's an issue that has to be changed, but it can only be changed through information. 
and through education. Okay, I do make the point here on my outline that don't expect me to answer every question I'm going to raise. Uh, but I want to talk about what risk is, etc., and work through some of these materials. What is risk? A definition of risk is really what is the likelihood of causing harm or that something bad will happen. And it's, done, it's a probability or likelihood. Is there a 80% chance I'm going to die as a result of something? Or is there only a 0 .00001 probability that I'm going to um, suffer harm from something? That probability is never zero. And it's seldom 100%. You know, the only sure things are death and taxes. Everything else is likely a little bit less than 100% and certainly greater than zero. And it's trying to find the right balance. I want to make the point that risk or hazard is not the same as a mechanism of action for a toxic substance. The talk yesterday on bisphenol A by Dr. Vomsal was very interesting. I was busy writing down references that he was list, had listed in his slides so I can follow up with a lot of those. But he talked about a mechanism of action. Interaction of a substance with an estrogen receptor. That is the mechanism of action that can lead to something. But it is not a harmful effect in and of itself. The harmful effect would be um, reduced fertility or some other effect on reproduction. Cancer is a hazard. It is caused by a mechanism of action that involves mutation of a cell. But the mutation in itself is not the, the, the uh, end point. It's not the hazard. It's strictly a mechanism of action. So I don't want you to think that just because a substance interacts with an estrogen receptor, that makes it hazardous. Does anybody here think anything is risk-free? The example I give in the slides is water. Water is toxic. In January, a woman in California, in Sacramento, died as a result of ingesting too much water as a function of a radio stunt trying to... There was some prize awarded for the person who could drink the most water without having to go to the bathroom. It's, oh, it was a Nintendo game. Okay, thank you. I, 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 in, in the slide, I had cut out the uh, CNN online report. So water is toxic. It dilutes electrolytes in the body to the point that your body shuts down. The water's toxic. Oxygen, which we require for life, is toxic. That's why it's all recommended that you eat lots of antioxidants. It's to try and remove those free radicals, those oxygenated substances from your, your body. I think oxygen is the primary cause of blindness in premature infants who are put in incubators because it is very hazardous at a high dose. Staying locked indoors 24 hours a day, seven um, hazardous locations to be present in, <laughs> your bathroom and your kitchen. Falls, cuts, infections resulting from cuts, etc., makes the home environment also hazardous. But we don't think twice about walking into the bathroom, going into the kitchen, picking up a knife and slicing up tomatoes for lunch or anything like that, but they do present risks. I just want to make sure everybody understands that. The next slide gives um, a bar chart of some lifetime risks, just for points of comparison. Some of these are voluntary, some are involuntary. But just to give you some sense of where certain activities fall, smoking cigarettes for 15 years is greater than a 1 in 10 chance of dying of some smoking-related illness. Lung cancer itself, only 1 in 12 smokers will actually come down with lung cancer, which is far less than you might expect. 80 to 90 percent of all lung cancers in the population are caused by smoking, but only about 1 in 12 smokers will get lung cancer specifically. They will suffer other ill effects, but they won't necessarily get cancer, which is the good news for the smoker who was talking about dental amalgam. Scuba diving for 15 years, riding a motorbike. I ride a motorbike. Uh, I do wear a helmet, which re greatly reduces my risk. I notice, I think this state doesn't require a helmet, has no helmet law. So you could notch that risk factor up by probably 10 times for m bikers who don't wear helmets. Because if I fall with a helmet on, I might get hurt, but chances are I'm not going to die if it's not a real serious accident. 
where you don't need a very serious accident to cause a head injury that could leave you paralyzed or dead if you're not wearing a helmet. So some of these choice factors do have some, carry some very significant risks. Um, I've got down here around the 10 to the minus 5 is really 1 in 100,000. 10 to the minus 6 on this scale is 1 in a million. Um, how many people like barbecue foods? Okay. One of, the single greatest car one of the single most potent carcinogens you can be exposed to is, is benzoapyrene. It's a, a PAH, a polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbon, and it's produced on barbecues. And barbecued food is very high in um, carcinogenic PAHs, uh, benzoapyrene being sort of the, the primary substance. So if you eat a lot of barbecued foods, you're actually at a greater risk of stomach cancer than people who don't eat barbecued foods. But I love barbecued foods, and I'm not going to stop because I weigh that against some of the other, and I, I know about it, you know? So I, I'm not going to let that potential risk stop me from enjoying a foods I like. And in fact, rats who are um, watered exclusively with distilled water have a higher rate of cancer than control rats who are watered on the basis of the regular tap water or, or mineralized or, or sort of naturally mineralized water. So all sorts of things can present risks un, and, and unexpectedly. The, the, what I have at the bottom of that, uh, that bar graph is mycosis fungoides. It's a form of cancer that affects T cells of the skin. It's not a skin cancer per se, but it does affect cells that occupy the skin. Uh, a good friend of mine was diagnosed with this disease about six weeks ago, um, just before I put these slides together, so I put it on. About a one in one million chance of contracting this cancer uh, in North America. It's thought, at least one theory is, that it's caused by, viral, uh, by a virus, but that's not confirmed. Chance of death or, or, or dying specifically of this disease is about 6 in 10 million. And the background cancer rate in North America, 1 in 3. Okay, 1 in 3 will uh, develop cancer in his or her lifetime, and about 1 in 4 will die of cancer or cancer related causes. And that sounds terrible, but when you look at 1 in 3 or 1 in 4, versus one, uh, six in 10 million, I've told my friend not to make his funeral arrangements yet because chances are he will never die of that disease. It's not a zero probability that he won't die from it, but chances are he won't. So I'm just trying to provide this as some balance um, and, and sort of and perhaps a counterpoint to the message I received yesterday listening to those talks that Dentistry and dental materials are going to hell in a handbasket, and I honestly do not believe that is true. Uh, the next slide, relative risk. Uh, the goal is to find the material that has the right combination of low risk, because it can never be zero, and high benefit. And what you're looking for truly is the material or materials that present the lowest risks for the equivalent benefit. I've often said, uh, I, I did not have time to put this information together for this talk because I was committed to some other things, but I was initially going to track information on the health effects associated with receiving no dental treatment at all. And there are issues, there are various diseases, infections, I believe heart disease in certain cases can be associated with poor oral hygiene, poor dental care. And my view is that some dental treatment is better than none. If I had a choice between having my teeth continue to ache and rot or any other problems I had and receiving treatment, I would go for the treatment. And if the only dental material that was available to me was dental amalgam, I hate to say it, but versus, no treatment versus treatment with dental amalgam, I would vote to receive amalgam. Now the question is, or the issue is, of course, we don't just have dental amalgam. We have a number of other materials, composite resins. We have gold and ceramics, 
and there are others, which uh, this area is uh, developing faster than I've been able to keep up with it. So the question is, can I get the benefit of dental treatment or caries uh, re restoration, repair, with a material that does the same job but presents lower risks? And in my view, composite resin does that. I've got here, can the health benefits outweigh the risks and can the risks outweigh the benefits? Um, and I listed just a number of issues where risks can be extremely high but benefits can be extremely high. Surgery, for instance, to remove cancer. Surgery to repair um, a heart defect. I have a colleague, uh, a person I knew in high school, died about three, four years ago. He was diagnosed with a very acute um, I think an atrial valve problem that if no surgery was done he would definitely have died. And the survival rate is less than 50% for the surgery but that risk versus dropping dead without any indication, he opted for the surgery but he died during that surgery. So you take certain risks with surgery but the benefits, if successful, far outweigh the disadvantages. Medical and dental x-rays, I'm sure all of you give, have your patients get x-rays from time to time. There is a calculable cancer risk associated with receiving those x-rays. But they are important. The benefits of receiving them allow a diagnosis or treatment that in the short to medium term, or even with the low rate of potential cancer that might result from that, you would deem them worthwhile. And as a dental patient, I get an x-ray about once every two years. And because I, I think it's worthwhile, I'm willing to accept that risk. Um, I've got immunization. That was talked about a lot by Boyd yesterday, and I'm not even going to talk about it here. Um, penicillin. Penicillin was a very successful antibiotic to which some people are deathly allergic. The majority of people it benefits, but there are those it does not. Question is, can you develop techniques for identifying those people who might be at risk? And usually that's trial and error. You know, you get asked at the hospital, are you allergic to penicillin? And you only know if you've had an allergic response to it before. I've got various drugs here. Thalidomide I have on the list. Of course, we know all the problems that resulted from um, administration of thalidomide to pregnant women. Thalidomide is back as a cancer treatment drug. Obviously not to pregnant women, but it has its medical applications and benefits that outweigh certain risks provided they're controlled. Cancer drugs, cancer treatment drugs, probably the single most potent class of carcinogenic substances. Most people who have had chemotherapy will develop secondary cancers later in life, assuming they have survived the first cancer. They will likely develop secondary cancers as a result of receiving that cancer drug because the drug is designed specifically to interact with cells to kill the cancer cells but it also interacts with healthy cells and can lead to the subsequent development of other types of cancer. And I can't help but think that if I was faced with having a cancer, I would not refuse to take those cancer drugs because of the potential risk later on, because I've got a particular problem right now I'd like to deal with in the shorter term. So these were just some examples where trade-offs of risk and benefit um, have to be weighed. We've got dental amalgam down here and dental composites and gold, etc., which I'm going to discuss a little bit more. Um, in terms of dental amalgam, you all know it's about 50% mercury by weight, most significant single source of mercury exposure in the North American population. Uh, right now, I think the average Canadian has six to eight fillings. Uh, use in Canada has been declining since 95, I am pleased to say. It's probably dropped that it represents only 35 to 40 percent of fillings placed anymore in Canada, where it used to be 85 to 90 percent. Uh, but a lot of that actually has absolutely nothing to do with people finding out that there's mercury in fillings, in, in, in amalgam fillings. This is because they are seeking aesthetic dental materials. And dentists are promoting aesthetic dental materials. And that has probably been the more significant cause of the decline in use of amalgam. People would prefer to see white teeth rather than silver ones. Health Canada does recommend avoiding use of amalgam in pregnant women, young children, in infants, um, and fillings. I don't know what your experience is from the data in Canada. Infants as young as three years old um, were noted, in, at least in one survey, of having amalgam fillings. 
So they, they are placed in quite young children at times. Uh, so don't use it in pregnant women, in children, persons with other metals in their mouth, particularly braces were identified, people with kidney ailments uh, and that sort of thing. Hence, there is certainly an increasing um, effort by dentists, yourselves I'm sure, by my dentist, to collect health information to make sure that what he does is not totally incompatible with the other, uh, other aspects of my health. Uh, the slide uh, 10, I think it is, it's a graph, lots of dots and a line through it. That is just a, um, a plot of mercury concentration in urine as a function of the number of amalgam fillings in people's mouths, just as confirmation that exposure to mercury does occur from amalgam fillings. I'm amazed at how often I still read material that claims there's no exposure. And there is an innumerable number of examples. The next slide, which shows, um, oh, there's a 13 or 15 estimates of mercury exposure on there, two of them from myself. Professionally, at least in the risk assessment, what I'll call risk assessment literature, the kind of literature and journals that I publish in, it's a given that mercury exposure occurs. It is not necessarily shared by, or that view, or what I would consider a fact, is not shared by all of the professional dental literature I have seen, which surprises me to some extent. And it's an unfortunate situation uh, in my view that somehow amalgam makes mercury safe. I have even seen that stated more or less in those terms, and I can't believe that um, professionals, well-educated uh, bodies of learned uh, ladies and gentlemen representing dental associations or what have you would um, present that kind of information, which I would consider categorically false. But um, no doubt they could argue differently with the information they prefer to, to draw on. Next graph down is really just a, a bar showing the various levels of, or the effects associated with various levels of mercury exposure. Uh, down near the bottom, I've got LOEL, L-O-A-E-L, just means lowest observed effect level. That means that they've observed effects of some kind, whether it be with the immune system or, or um, other factors, and have not detected a uh, threshold yet. Uh, the latest research by Diana Echevarria and colleagues would suggest that there is no threshold for subtle effects of mercury on the immune system, possibly on the neurological system. And I'll emphasize subtle. These are not clinical signs and symptoms. It isn't an effect that would necessarily prevent a dentist from working. But you can demonstrate that the mercury is interacting with a person's physiology in a dose-dependent way that appears not to reduce to zero effect before exposure is zero. So there seems to be some measurable level of effect um, at all doses measured other than zero currently, which is interesting. That's an assumption made for cancer. Even one molecule of exposure, or exposure to one molecule of a cancer agent is assumed to cause some calculable level of risk, which is very minuscule. You don't often see it with non-carcinogenic substances, of which mercury is. The two where you see this, lead and its effects on children's uh, intelligence or IQ scores, and mercury in terms of very subtle neurological effects, uh, protoporphyrin levels, et cetera, in the kidneys, seems to be another one. And maybe it will be a pattern that is identified to be associated with heavy metals generally as time progresses. I don't know that for sure. But like I said, the most recent literature suggests that no threshold truly exists, below which no effect exists. Uh, dental amalgam, I've got some slides here, three or four slides, to deal with risks to dentists who remove amalgam. You have a number of different sources of exposure. Most of you will think about mercury vapor as the primary risk, say removing fillings from your patient's mouths when you're doing this work. Mercury vapor is a very minor component of that exposure and risk. It's particulate matter that you really have to worry about. When a drill and a dental drill running three or 400,000 RPM, I believe, hits anything solid, it just creates a mist of submicron particles. And inhalation of those particles is probably your greatest risk in terms of total dose of mercury. 
Uh, the, one of the graphs here just shows some of the levels of mercury vapor that are observed when there is different forms of removal, whether it's dry or whether you using various forms of um, uh, water spray and cooling, etc. But the cloud of particulate matter that's generated during a removal process, if done dry with no suction or no other um, means of suppressing the levels, can produce an equivalent mercury concentration of around 85,000 micrograms per cubic meter of air. Doesn't last long, lasts during the duration of that pr procedure, but that's a huge dose that is not picked up through normal monitoring of office air, if, you're, if you've got mercury monitors in the office. And it is measurable. There are studies that have actually measured the uh, dose of particulate matter inhaled. There are interesting, there are studies in the literature on the particulate met load in the lungs of dental technicians who work on uh, preparing bridges and false teeth and that sort of thing because they have to grind things to fit and they have measurable loads of particulate matter in their lungs from just doing those procedures. So you can imagine some of the loads that dentists might have. Um, the one thing with amalgam particulate, submicron, uh, is it's a probably, it disappears from your lungs probably three to four days based on the literature that's available. So it, it dissolves, it evaporates, it disappears. You have phagocytes in your lungs that basically engulf particles, move them to your lymph system. They are moved out of the lungs. So it's not like it would even stay there for, for all that long, but that dose is delivered to you as a person as opposed to being exhaled without it ill effect. Next slide I have really just shows a grid work. Just to give you an idea, how many people here wear the standard surgical mask when they're doing their uh, work on their patients? Okay. And how many people remove amalgam fillings from patients and wear those masks thinking they provide protection? They do not. Those masks are designed for um, predominantly to prevent inhalation of microbial matter, um, a lip, you know, microscopic organisms. Um, their filter size or sieve size is about three microns. And with a dental, dental amalgam, when it's drilled out, uh, the average size of those particles is well less than two microns. And 65% of the particles, I think, are less than one micron. So the particles themselves will pass through those surgical masks. So if you are removing dental amalgam fillings, you should be taking different precautions. Either, um, and a HEPA filter, which is rated to 0.45 microns, probably won't help either. Um, positive respirator or some other source of fresh air to you and your patient is probably the right way to go. And in fact, when I had my amalgams removed, I sought out that, uh, a, a clinic with that um, facility, that type of facility. So I was breathing basically bottled air, not contaminated by all the amalgams that were being removed from my mouth, uh, seven one day and six the next, and my mouth ached for weeks, but um, I sought out a clinic that had that kind of equipment as opposed to going to a local dentist that did not. Uh, not so much worrying about my den the, the dentist's health, but mine, but he had a, an air supply for himself as well, which was the right thing to do, in my view, just as an occupational protection. The, I have a graph here with a number of bar charts on it. Uh, need to explain it a little bit, and it's in black and white, my apologies. Uh, the white bars just represent the percent of dentists or the percent of the general population. The second bar is dentists. Um, so dentists show up in the... the third, fourth, and fifth set of bars, counting from the left, uh, because most, the general public doesn't have high levels of exposure, but it's the percent of dentists that fall into the categories of urinary mercury concentration based on published literature. So approximately 10% of dentists show up with greater than 20 micrograms per liter of urine, at least from the literature that was available at the time. This comes from a graph I prepared in my analysis or my contribution to Sweden for their analysis. Uh, and I wouldn't say that everybody agrees with this. The peer reviewers for Sweden did not necessarily agree with this analysis either. But it was an extrapolation based on precautionary principle. If you're seeing certain proportions of 
um, ill effect at certain levels, you can project the increased prevalence of the ill effect at higher levels of exposure. So what I've shown on this graph is, for instance, at greater than 20 micrograms of mercury per liter of urine, 10% of dentists fall into that category, but greater than 90% of those dentists will have abnormal, likely have abnormal hand tremor. It won't be clinical, it'll be subclinical, but you would predict that at least 90% of dentists that are routinely exposed to that level would have that high level of an intention tremor. And you would have approximately 40% um, would have abnormal levels of a molecule called NAG, N-acetyl glycidyl something or other, I forget what it stands for. It's a chemical that shows up in the urine as a marker for uh, metals exposure. So, and, and has been linked to various ill effects, or either itself representing um, an impact on the kidney or as a biomarker for other more serious effects. So you, you have quite a high potential incidence of these effects occurring in dentists with high levels of exposure. And it, of course, the rates of, of effect decline as the levels of exposure decline. Uh, that's kind of the nature of risk assessment, is trying to make those projections for the incidence of exposure. So what I'm trying to say here is, if you have high levels of exposure, you should probably try and reduce it. You can reduce it predominantly by preventing exposure to particulate matter when you're removing amalgam fillings. Probably the single biggest blow you can make 